This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to the commencement ceremonies for the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, welcome to the Goldman School faculty behind me here. We're all wearing our colors. This is the time of year where we get to wear robes and have our colors and act like the gang that we are, which is a lot of fun. Also, welcome to the students and the staff and the families. So my name is Henry Brady. It's my privilege to be the dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. And today, we're here to honor, celebrate, and to congratulate the Goldman School of Public Policy Class of 2014. You know, what a great time to be graduating from a public policy school and to be embarking upon a career of public service. Events around the world a weak government in Ukraine, a feeble and poorly performing government in Nigeria, an autocratic despotism in North Korea, and the ongoing stories of disorder in the Middle East, these events show us how important it is to have governments, government is good, government can do good things, that can protect and serve their societies, and to have strong nonprofit sector that can provide services for and give voice to people in need. The world needs public servants who can act ethically and who can get things done and who can provide leadership and innovation. The Goldman School of Public Policy, through its, and I know you're all waiting for me to say this, its tripartite set of goals, <laughs> the students mock me at the talent show over this, I appreciate it, but, but this is what we're about. We're about excellence. Being the best public policy school in the country, in the world. We're about mission. We want the world to be a better place. And we mean that, sincerely. And ultimately, we're about community. Because the way that you make a world a better place is to build communities, communities that can help people become better at what they do and what they want to do. And that's what the Goldman School of Public Policy does. OK, so it's my privilege now to introduce our graduation speaker. Uh, ben Rhodes is the assistant to the president and deputy national security advisor for strategic communications and speech writing, a job you can imagine that is fraught uh, with lots of complexities these days. Uh, he oversees President uh, Obama's national security communications, speech writing, and global engagement. He has traveled with the president uh, in various places. So the president has gone abroad and made speeches and talked with world leaders. So he's had some extraordinary experiences uh, through those 
trips. Uh, previously, he served as dire deputy director of the White House speech writing, such as, and he was a senior speech writer for the Obama campaign. So he's been with the Obama campaign since very, very early, uh, going back to before Obama was elected president in 2008. And prior to uh, joining Obama, he worked as for several years as special assistant to Lee Hamilton. Lee Hamilton may not be well known on this coast, but he was uh, a member of Congress, and he's one of those members of Congress I wish we had a lot more of, an exceptionally knowledgeable, exceptionally talented guy uh, who really brought evidence, knowledge, information to bear on public policy. Uh, so Ben Rhodes worked with him at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, there he helped draft the Iraq Study Group report, which Lee Hamilton was involved with, and the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. He is co-author with Lee Hamilton and Tom Keene of Without Precedent, the inside story of the 9-11 Commission. So he's really dealt with some of the fundamental issues, 9-11, Iraq, and now all the issues confronting the Obama White House, the fundamental national security uh, in international issues uh, confronting the world and the Obama administration. Uh, he's a native of New York City. He has a BA from Rice University, so he knows Texas as well as uh, the East Coast, uh, and has an MFA from New York University where he actually learned to write fiction. And I think he's gonna tell you a little bit about how that maybe is different uh, than what he does now, which is try to communicate the president's perspective which some people might want to pretend or presume is fiction, but in fact, uh, I imagine that he's trying really, really hard to provide the evidence and the information that we all need to actually understand the world. Thank you, Ben Rhodes, for coming here, and welcome. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dean Brady, Dean Chavez, um, the faculty and staff uh, of the Goldman School, uh, to the family and friends of the graduates who are here, um, and above all, to the class of uh, 2014. Uh, it's an honor to be with you here today, and thank you for uh, getting me out of Washington uh, for the weekend. Um, I, uh, as a commencement speaker, I also am acutely aware of having sat here uh, that I'm the only thing standing in between you and this pile of diplomas here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and the, the failures that will follow uh, getting those <laughs> diplomas. So maybe I'll go on a little longer. Um, at 36, I know uh, I'm young to be a commencement speaker. Uh, that does mean, though, that I have a fairly recent memory of sitting where you are today. Um, I don't remember much about what my commencement speaker said. Uh, I remember kind of shaking off a, a night before. I remember uh, planning where we we're gonna go to lunch with my family. Um, and I remember wondering uh, what on earth I was gonna do with the rest of my life. Um, I can't help on the first two, um, so I'll, I'll focus my time on the third. Um, usually, um, I work on speeches like this uh, for President Obama. So the most natural thing for me to do uh, would be to tell you about how, when I left school, I packed up my car and moved to the south side of Chicago to be a community organizer. Um, I, I can't use that story today. Uh, it's too bad, because it works every time. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, I'll share a few thoughts rooted uh, in my own experience. Um, because I've had the profound uh, honor, uh, really, of working in the White House uh, and at a young age, um, I do often try to meet with students who come to town, and public policy students in particular. Um, and uh, they walk into my office, which um, is, is in the West Wing, but you know, it's one of those windowless offices uh, like you always look forward to occupying. Um, <laughs> and I notice that their eyes often turn to a photograph uh, on the wall while they're talking to me. And it's, a photograph of me with then Senator Obama and Dennis McDonough, who's now the White House Chief of Staff, on the first day that I worked for uh, then Senator Obama in early 2007. And I kind of see what they're thinking as they look back and forth at the photo of me. Uh, the president has uh, that dark hair of the campaign posters of 2008. Uh, Dennis has dark hair. I have hair. Um, and a lot's changed for the three of us uh, in the years <laughs> since. Uh, but today I get to wear a hat, so that's a good thing. Um, but that wear and tear has, of course, been worth it. 
Um, and so with the rest of my time, uh, I'll answer the question that students most ask me, which is what kind of plan should they have uh, when they leave school uh, and pursue careers in this field? Uh, and I'll just make five uh, brief points. The first point is don't have a plan. Uh, plans sometimes work for public policy, sometimes they don't. Um, but in life, sticking to a plan limits your options. Uh, it tends to rule out risk taking. And no plan can account for luck, uh, which you're going to need, uh, and bad luck, which is going to come as well. Uh, so from love to work, you'll find that so many of the best things that you'll encounter in life are unplanned. Uh, and you have to see where those things take you. And you have to get up, of course, after uh, the inevitable failure. Uh, the second point is to connect your story to the wider world. Uh, in some ways, you made that choice by focusing on policy. Uh, when I was in grad school, as was said, I got a master's in uh, fiction writing, which uh, does provide endless material for critics of the president and critics of myself. If you Google me, you'll find that. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, in addition to going class when I was at grad school, I had jobs teaching community college, uh, working uh, as a researcher for CBS Sports, uh, giving out free shots of Jägermeister and bars. Uh, <laughs> they, did, they did pay for that. Um, but also working on local political campaigns. So I had lots of different interests, and I didn't know exactly where I was going to go. The natural progression for me coming out of a program like that I would go into publishing and trying to write one of those novels about a young writer trying to write a novel in New York City. <laughs> um, very rich material. Um, then one morning, I was handing out flyers for a city council campaign uh, in Brooklyn that I was working on. Uh, and it was primary day, um, September 11, 2001. Uh, and from where I was on the Brooklyn waterfront, I saw the second plane hit uh, and the first tower fall. Uh, and suddenly, my little world got a lot bigger. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, uh, but I knew that whatever I was going to do next, I wanted to be a part of how the world was going to respond to what I'd just seen. And for me, that choice, uh, that sense of the world opening up for me, made all the difference. Uh, it led me down to offices in Washington where I tried to talk my way into jobs uh, as a writer for foreign policy magazines. That didn't work, but one of those editors was nice enough and wise enough to tell me that if I wanted to write and learn about foreign policy, I should become a speechwriter, uh, something that until that moment had never even occurred to me. Uh, and that's what led me to Lee Hamilton. So it may not be something as dramatic as 9-11, but every day there are changes that are remaking our world, that are moving us towards war or towards peace, that are breakthroughs in everything from healthcare policy to urban planning to uh, fighting crime, uh, to the new demands that come from transformative change in technology or the climate. Uh, and your world, uh, your opportunities, will be a lot bigger if you figure out how to connect your story to those events that are taking place uh, around you. The third point is to find your own voice, which is an easy thing for a speechwriter to say. Um, but let me, let me try to explain that a little bit by telling you a story about a speech. And that's a speech that uh, President Obama delivered the night of the New Hampshire primary in 2008. Uh, and you have to remember the time we had won Iowa. We were way up in, in New Hampshire. Uh, so we pulled together all of the different messages of that campaign and tried to distill it into the core of the message. Uh, and then we concluded the speech with a call and response uh, using then Senator Obama's 2004 slogan, Yes, We Can. Normally, you write two speeches for an election night, um, a losing speech and a victory speech. But we didn't bother with the losing speech because we were so far up in the polls. Uh, we had it locked up. And then he lost. Um, it was too late to write a new speech, um, so we just changed the first line of the speech to congratulate Hillary Clinton for her hard-fought victory. Uh, and we kept the rest of the speech the same. Um, and you know what? It was better as a losing speech, um, because it was all about overcoming long odds. Now, why did it work, um, putting aside the Will I Am video? Um, <laughs> It had nothing to do with speechwriters, really, uh, because what I always tell people is if you close your eyes uh, and you imagine any other political figure delivering the same speech, you know, Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan or Jesse Jackson or John Kerry, it wouldn't work at all. But by January of 2008, Barack Obama had his own voice and his own message. It set him apart from other people, and it carried him and probably uh, into the White House. So why is this relevant to you? Well, no matter what you choose to do, you're going to need your own voice. You're going to have to find what makes you different from everybody else. 
you are graduating from the number one public policy graduate school in the country and the world. But a whole bunch of people graduated from here last year. <laughs> a whole bunch of people are going to graduate from here next year. This week, this month, there are a whole bunch of other schools handing out diplomas like this from top tier schools. So you have to figure out what's going to make you different from those people. Wherever you go, whether it's politics or government, uh, the private sector, nonprofits, the academics, you're going to figure out what experience and expertise, uh, what passion, what type of personality is going to make you different from everybody else in the room. If you do that, it will work out whether you win or lose, whether you succeed or fail. The fourth point, public policy matters. It really does matter. Uh, I'll tell one story uh, to highlight that. In November of 2012, uh, President Obama became the first U.S. president to visit Burma. Uh, in a country where it used to be illegal to just gather in a crowd, uh, there were tens of thousands of people lining uh, the motorcade route. Uh, in the house where Aung San Suu Kyi was imprisoned, she sat down at a small table with Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and talked about her work in parliament. And then we went to a university that had been shut down because of its role in the democracy movements and had been reopened for this occasion. Uh, and the president addressed an audience that included both political prisoners and the government officials who had put them in prison and then released them. So it was an exciting moment. And it was a sign that policy uh, can affect change over a long period of time in an area like foreign policy. But then I went back to Burma by myself last summer. And what I founded is what they needed more than anything else was you. In building after building, I met with minister after minister. Uh, and these are like big cavernous buildings that the Chinese helped them build um, back before they decided to move in a different direction. And some of these ministers were dedicated reformers. Um, some of them probably aren't. Uh, but whatever you think about the will of that government to reform, they needed to know how to reform. They needed public policy experts. They needed to know how to map their terrain and figure out how to get agricultural goods to market. They needed to know how to write laws to reform how land is owned or how media can operate. They needed people who could turn ceasefires with ethnic insurgencies into lasting national reconciliation. They're not going to make it unless they can find people like you. You know, so much upheaval in our world today is rooted in a desire by people to have a say in how they're governed. But it's also about having a government that can respond to people's aspirations. It's one thing to put 100,000 people in a square. It's a lot harder to root out the corruption that put them in the square in the first place. But that's the long game. That's ultimately what public policy and only public policy can do. That's what's going to determine whether, in five years or 10 years, people would rather live in Crimea or Kiev, in Damascus or in Tunis, in Pyongyang or Rangoon. The fifth and final point is don't give in to cynicism. Uh, I'll admit every day Washington gives me plenty of reasons to give in to cynicism. <laughs> um, some days more than others, too. But uh, you know, it's easy to slip inside a bubble when you're in Washington. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting that being in Washington, sometimes you lose sight of the importance of public policy. Uh, because it's a place where sometimes the thing that matters most is the next election, uh, and all the noise that feeds the beast until then. And in this world, facts are less important than opinion. Conflict is more valued than competence. And campaigning often matters more than governing. But for all the focus on that, that has nothing to do with how change actually happens in people's lives. I wrote a lot of speeches in the 2007-2008 campaign about ending the war in Iraq. You know how many troops that brought home from Iraq? None. But then, when I was in government, I was able to sit in the Situation Room in the first weeks of the presidency and see President Obama make a decision, communicate a decision to his military uh, to have a withdrawal plan for Iraq and all of those troops came home. That's actual change. There's a lot of people that you can turn on the TV and see any day talking about 
repealing Obamacare, uh, they say other things about Obamacare too. But do you know how many people that has helped? None. But 8 million people signed up for the healthcare exchanges while those people were talking on television. That's actual change. So you just have to remind yourself that there's the noise and then there's the actual work of public policy. We were talking about climate change. Uh, and you still have, uh, it, Washington is one of the few places in the world where it's still controversial to acknowledge that human beings might have something to do with climate change. Uh, for all that noise, uh, even as there's difficulties in Congress, the President is now looking at ways, again, of reforming how we use coal-fired power plants, how we finance our energy sector, how we develop clean energy. You can make change even when the environment around it can seem to be frustrating and disappointing and let you down. And this extends far beyond the kind of big headline issues that people focus on a lot. You know, one of the things I get to do in my job is, is work on our public diplomacy and our education exchange programs. Uh, these are not things that get headlines. Uh, but it's amazing to see how they can change lives. Uh, in 2009, for instance, President Obama decided to send more English language teachers to villages in Malaysia. When I traveled to Malaysia last year, uh, first of all, these teachers were like professional athletes in the Malaysian media. People knew where they were and they were kind of celebrated for what they were doing. Uh, so I knew the program was a success, um, but I got to sit down and meet with some of those teachers and their students. And as we were going around, people were telling stories about how meeting these Americans changed their views of America. There was one kind of student who looked uh, like, I wasn't sure that he was happy to be there. You know, he was kind of staring at the table, um, and I wasn't sure what he was going to say when it was his turn. He was a teenager. It's a difficult phase, or at least it was for me. Um, when it got to him, I asked him, what did you get out of this experience? And other people had told long stories, and he just said, courage. Uh, and then I looked over at his teacher, and I said, well, what are you going to miss about this young woman who's been your teacher? And he kind of looked down at the table, and he said, her smile. You know, that's a connection that was forged by public policy, um, but can't be, cannot be underestimated. Those, the accumulation of all of those types of activities add up to something much bigger that can't even be quantifiable even with the best cost-effective analysis. <laughs> Half a world away in Benin, there was a young woman named Kate Pusey, who was like that teacher. Kate was a Peace Corps volunteer um, in a blog uh, she wrote about teaching 22 girls about self-confidence, good decision-making, family planning, women's health, conflict resolution, and healthy communications. Within a few months of that time, she was murdered after she courageously reported that she thought children were being abused uh, at a school where she worked. Kate's family decided to make sure that other Peace Corps volunteers had greater protections than she had. So there are clear guidelines for dealing with assault and volunteers who report crimes have the confidentiality they deserve. And her brother, David, who's been a student here um, and is here today, uh, he reached out to countless congressional offices. Uh, he called one after another, and one that he found actually was an office where my wife, Anne, worked. And they worked for months and months and months on this bill. Um, and it was over, you know, initially there was reluctance by the Peace Corps to support it, but they had to bring past abuses to light, and they had to do something very difficult in Washington today, which is find a bipartisan consensus uh, in support of this. Uh, and they got that bill passed. And I met David briefly outside the Oval Office uh, for the first time before he and his family then watched President Obama sign the bill that was named for Kate Pusey into law. And that's, that's change. That's change that's going to, again, change the way that the Peace Corps operates and the way that young Americans can be protected around the world. That bill was signed on November 21st, 2011. Almost exactly two years later, uh, I joined President Obama in another Peace Corps commemoration, and this was the 50th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's assassination. Uh, and we, we marked that in the Situation Room in a conference room that was named after John F. Kennedy because uh, he had built that facility because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we were joined by members of the Shriver family and, and Harris Wofford, who helped start the Peace Corps. And at exactly 2 p.m., the time that President Kennedy passed away, we observed a moment of silence. And then the President spoke by video conference with Peace Corps volunteers in Tanzania, who talked with pride about the work they were doing. 
So President Kennedy's legacy is the Peace Corps that Kate Pusey served in. Kate Pusey's legacy is a Peace Corps in which those volunteers in Tanzania are more protected. Both of them were taken from us, but their life lives on in other people. And that's the change that public policy can bring to people around the world. And shame on anybody who would give in to cynicism, given the sacrifices that people like that have made. When you leave here, I can guarantee you one thing. You will hear from a lot of people who run down the notion of public service or the idea of government itself. There's a whole industry dedicated to that these days. It's doing quite well. <laughs> I can personally vouch for that. But don't listen to those people. There have always been people who have stood in the way that, of the progress that public policy can bring. Those are not the people uh, that are remembered. They never brought a smile to the face of a child a half a world away in Malaysia or Benin, or they never bought a better life to the family next door, uh, whether it's a family that wants to live in a safer community in East Palo Alto uh, or a family that wants to know that they can have health insurance without going bankrupt. So cynicism is easy. Anybody can do that. Change is difficult, and it's going to take you. Really, if we could clone you, uh, we'd be better off, uh, given the need for good and better public policy across this country. So my advice uh, before you take this piece of paper is never forget what made you care about these issues in the first place. Connect your story to something bigger that is going on around you. And also never forget that each and every one of you can and will change the world in a way that is totally unique. Don't ever forget that. Congratulations. Well, have courage, everybody. We're almost finished. Um, that's an important point, by the way. I really think courage is one of the fundamental things that good public policy analysts and, and leaders in the public sector need these days. You've heard people talk about failure today. You've heard them talk about how tough it is to get things done. But what you need is courage. Uh, two years ago, I was in China, in Taiwan, actually, and I met with uh, one, somebody who had been through one of our executive programs. He's a doctor. He's now running a hospital. He had decided to help save a leper colony in Taiwan, the only one left uh, that was at risk of being closed because of a metro station that was going to go through that area. And he managed to do that. And I asked him, well, what did you learn when you came to our program? What, what was it you got out of it? And he said, courage. And that really is an important thing. Have the courage to take risks. Have the courage to try to do things that you're not even sure you could possibly do. Choose to try to do really hard things. That's what I think distinguishes Goldman School graduates. And I'm hoping we help give you the basis to have that courage because, because you have learned how to think about public policy and how to implement public policy, I hope you have the courage to say, why not? Let's try it. Maybe we can get it done. And if we do, it'll be wonderful. So with that, I ask the graduates to stand. The first thing I want to do is thank our faculty, but especially our staff, who just do such a fabulous job here for this event and for all the other wonderful things they do for us. So thank you to them. But now I get to say the one official thing I get to do every year. It's really wonderful. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the president and regents of the University of California, I grant you this degree from the Goldman School of Public Policy. Congratulations. <laughs>